So there are his objectives right there. You guys can go back and read that. Um, okay, so just basic stuff that's done in the lab. You have culturing, testing, differentiation, and research. You guys know that. And then you have these goals that are listed in a microbiology lab. And these goals, they might be a little bit different coming from Shands and going to North Florida. Like each lab might have its own kind of set of goals. But in general, it kind of revolves around those four, okay? That right there, that's just sort of information for you. You're, you're not gonna be tested on this slide or anything like that, okay? All right, you guys have seen this already, the psychrophilic, mesophilic, thermophilic, um, atmospheric conditions, the oxygen. Remember the different levels of oxygen that we were doing in the tubes? Um, carbon dioxide loving were the capnophilic organisms. And then you have other nutritional factors that can come into play, the carbon growth factors, the NAD and the hemin. Remember which plate those are located in? Um, BAD? No, no it's BAD. the chocolate. 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 Okay. chocolate. Yep, good job. Um, pH, you have that in almost all your plates, the pH, with the exception of like BAP, I would say, and chocolate. Um, like MAC and MSA, that's what is going to have the color change in the plates. And then, of course, the sodium content, which would be indicative of which plate are we looking at? MSA? MSA. 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 Yep, Rantel salt auger. Okay? This just gives you a little bit of background on the actual media itself. You can have anything from the solid, the liquids, the broth, the semi-solid. I don't think you guys have yet seen the semi-solid. That's something called Sims Media. Um, I think he has a slide on that. It basically, it looks like a broth, but it's a little bit gelatin, like a solid. So it's kind of weird, it falls in between. Um, based on the ingredients, you can put them into these categories. Transport media, you have stuff such as um, Amy's media or Stewart's media that they use. Um, even charcoal they'll use at times, depending on what the organism is. And you do need to know that, what I just said. And, and, and what else? See, no, everybody's paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> what? What'd you ask though? What did I just say? Uh, it's Amy's Media and Charcoal. Stewart's. Yeah, Amy's, Stewart's, and, ch and Charcoal. Never said chocolate. Um, selective and differential, you guys are familiar with those. Okay. This is pretty cool. I wanted to hand this out to you guys to see. This is actually some of the stuff that goes on in the actual clinical lab for microbiology depending on the different um, tests that they do. It's hard to see up here, but they'll go through like what they do with a urine culture, a vaginal swab, and there's all different scenarios on here and like what they're actually using, okay? This is online. This is when I studied for the first quiz. That's I this is online? Yeah, yeah I think I that's where he pulled quiz. it from. It's a really cool handout that he has on there. And if you want a copy of this, I can make it for you. Um, but it's in the PowerPoint, okay? All right, um, solid media, he's given you an example of the SB auger that we know grows fungus, which by the way, we have two fungal plates that are growing. So we'll need to look at those. It's not that cool, it's a little scary. <laughs> right. Okay, all right, TSA, solid media, of course you guys know that one, it's gonna be wide variety of bacterium. McConkey. This can be classified basically as selective and differential, okay? Selective because of the gram negative, <coughs> differential because of the pH indicator. Um, you guys see the difference here? It's hard to see, it looks almost black, but it should be almost like purpley, the E. coli, versus like the salmonella is a non-lactose fermenter, so you get like that clear brownish color, okay? Um, MSA, and that's exactly what it will look like if you're dealing with staph. You can have the bright yellow for aureus versus kind of this fuchsia color for epidermis, and that's exactly how you tell them apart. It's really easy. Once you get to that step and you see that, boom, you know you're working with staph and you can stop, okay? Um, BAP, there you go with all your different hemolysis. Everybody's straight on the different hemolysis, right? Because that will be on the exam as well. I mean, that's like a basic question. Alpha, beta, and gamma. All right, make sure you know that. Chocolate. So, uh, he's so funny. He's like, there's no actual chocolate in the auger. 
which some people think. Basically, it's just sliced red blood cells, and that's why it turns to a chocolate color. Um, and it contains the factors D and X, so homophilus influenza grows well, and so does Neisseria, meningitis. Um, e and B, selective and differential. Here's a good one for, this would be like an E. coli right here, or excuse me, right here, the metallic green sheet. Um, PEA as well. The ones that we're working with in the lab for PEA, they're not looking like these because we have 5% sheep's blood in our PEA. Okay, just so you guys don't get confused on that. But again, cockeyed mixed floral specimens for PEA. All right, this is the stuff that you guys haven't been hit with yet, and you're going to get it, I don't know, a couple labs from now. Um, this is all the biochemicals basically that you're using on enteric bacteria or gram negatives. <clears throat> Your most important one, I think, out of all of them would be the triple sugar iron auger. Okay, because you can test for different sugars or you can test for hydrogen sulfide. So like, example, salmonella will produce hydrogen sulfide. You have this big black um, uh, media that it turns and it cracks the media. And that's like a staph thing again. You see that and you know right away, oh, I'm dealing with salmonella. So it's pretty cool. And then based on what colors they're turning, you can differentiate what the fermentation is. If it was glucose, lactose, and or sucrose, etc. Okay, you guys should have worked with these in 2010. They're red and they're slanted. I would hope you did, right? Yeah, you snake it out, kind of. Yeah. Okay, Simon Citrate, that's another one that is basically the same thing in terms of it's a slant tube. This one's good for enterics as well. But ability to use citrate as the sole carbon source is what's going on there, okay? So positive citrate, here you are with the royal blue. And then if it's negative, it's going to stay uh, green. And I can't remember right off the top of my head, but I want to say that E. coli and something, I don't remember if it was Klebsiella or not, is differentiated with the citrate. One of them is positive, but I don't think it's E. coli. Um, this is the SIMS that I'm talking about. This test is pretty awesome, okay? Because you have three tests in one, basically. You have sulfide production, so the sulfur if you're turning black in the broth. Indole production, okay? That's basically an amino acid that it's looking for. So you grow it up and then you add a little drop. And if you get this pink at the top, then it's indole positive. Then you're also looking for motility. So you can see kind of the stab lines on some of these. When you see that, like this is a good one, that means that it's definitely motile. So you have three tests in one. You guys will be working with these as well. These can give you a lot of information. Okay, and those are like a semi-solid tube. I would classify that as. OF glucose, this is another one that you guys will um, get to as well. So you're looking for the determination of oxidative and fermentative carbohydrates, okay? Um, these are just your possibilities here. Whether it's oxidative or fermentative, it's either gonna stay green or turn yellow, okay? And you know, like when you go and look at this PowerPoint, you don't have to memorize all the different color combinations and stuff like that. Like I won't ask you um, OF2 that's forest green, was incubated and then turned yellow, what does that mean? You know, it, there won't be questions like that, but you do have to know, like, what is the OF glucose media? What is it used for? Okay? Yeah. Does it show utility as well? No, this, I don't know what is going on here. Um, it really isn't used for motility, although it does look like you can see the stab lines in there. Um, they don't read motility off of these tubes. Gotcha. But, it looks like you can actually see something going on there. You're going back to Sims uh, tubes for the motility. Yeah. These are really good pictures. This will give you an idea of what the thiofluid would look like, and that would be the fluid that, um, when I drew on the board, it would basically look like this, depending on which organism you have. That's like a really good picture of that. Um, you guys will be working with the thiofluid too, and you'll get to see some of those things that are going on. Um, urea broth, okay? So we were talking about Proteus, and what was the other one? Proteus. 
indicator, if it's positive, boom, it's going to be fuchsia. Proteus is going to turn like that. Um, Micrococcus luteus, it will probably be about a 12-hour incubation period. But Proteus, you know right away. Okay, this is just later on. You guys can take a look at this. He added in a little case study. Okay, um, I'm assuming this had to do with meningitis. I don't remember exactly. But anyway, if you take a look at it really quick, what will be the primary culture media for this? If we're talking about meningitis. Who cares about the age and all that? What would be the, if we're talking about meningitis, what would be your primary culture media that you would start with? See, like this, you'd have to know. What did I say about fastidious organisms? And I gave chocolate, you two examples. Chocolate. chocolate would be your media of choice. They see your meningitis. It needs those factors in the chocolate auger. Okay? Remember that? Yeah. yeah. The and then the other one was what? There was one other organism that I mentioned about chocolate. Age influenza? Yeah, hom yeah. homophilus influenza. Yeah. yeah. It's in the slides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But just so you guys, you know, are starting to get that. Okay. Um, that takes care of that. Let's move on. All right. This one, you guys, if you've already looked at it, you have like a lot of just definitions and things going on in here. Here are your objectives right here, okay? Here's another case in point. I'd like, I'm not going to talk about it right now, but I'd like you guys to actually look at it when you have time, okay, and just see if you can piece it together. Okay, so healthcare setting infections and control. All right, so within this, you have to know the setting and what the description is. So if I'm saying acute care, remember that it's going to be hospitals ambulatory care, outpatient surgery, ER care, that type of thing. So make sure you know that list and can differentiate between that list. Okay, because that's on the test as well. So, so far, just a straight up setting and it gives you a description. Okay, your terms right here, okay, for your surveillance definitions. Primary infection, what do you think we're talking about? All the main infection? Yeah, the main infection, um, usually single or specific. Um, bloodstream infection, that's pretty, uh, what do I want to say? Sepsis. Yeah, you could think of sepsis, bacteria in the blood. Um, central line, that's usually with an intravascular uh, device. Surgical site infection. That would have to do from a procedure, obviously. Then you have UTI and then ventilator-associated pneumonia, okay? And then tracheal tube, probably on that one. So how are you going to define the infection? First, you're going to determine the site of the infection, atomically, I'm speaking, okay? And then what are the risk factors involved? Like, did the person have a primary infection already, or is this a secondary infection? Um, what were the procedures? What did the person undergo? Was he under surgery or that type of thing, okay? That's actually how they'll define the infections altogether, by those three factors. Then you have general or targeted surveillance. Um, you guys need to know the definitions of these. Is it, did anybody tackle any of these in terms of getting the definitions done? No, but it's fine. Um, Total, you're talking, obviously, all infections, they're going to be recorded and analyzed for surveillance, okay? So all the infections. <clears throat> the infection rate, you are trying to establish whether the number of infections has increased or decreased. So that would be what you're doing with infection rates. Targeted surveillance, specifically high-risk, high-volume procedures that they're looking at for targeted surveillance. And then baseline data, I think we all know what that is. You're looking at historical infections basically over time. And then who remembers what prevalence is? You guys should have had that in 2010. Is the ability for to infect someone? Uh, it's like the number of cases wow. of a disease and then in such and such and it's such. Out of 100 or something? You can use that as a base, but it's um, in a given moment in time in a given population. Okay. 
so the number of cases in a given moment of time in a given population. Okay. Um, common microbes of uh, infection control. So healthcare setting, you're talking about various microorganisms and disease. In terms of public health, like daycare centers, schools, prisons, uh, that type of thing, your most common culprits would be like Salmonella, Shigella, um, Guardia, um, acute care, Staph aureus, MRSA is a big one. I'm sure, Lance, that you're familiar with most of these, yeah. right? E. coli, Sigmonis, Clostridium difficile is a big one too. That's we call very that code brown. Code brown? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's gross. It's, it's, yeah. it's very acute diarrhea. Um, from, I think, basically like over antibiotic use yeah. in the hospital. There's um, broad spectrum antibiotics and the high doses and it kills the normal flora. And, and then you're done, yeah. Ambulatory care, interestingly enough, you're looking at different hepatitises. HIV is on there, MRSA, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa, okay? Um, reportable diseases. You guys need to know these classes and be able to differentiate these classes, um, and then also basically give an example for these classes. There'll be a couple questions on the test on this slide alone, okay? So class 1A, major health concern. Obviously, anthrax would be up there, at least we would hope so. These, these classifications kind of crack me up, too, because A2, timely next day response. Well, you wonder who's desk he's sitting on, right? So encephalitis, foodborne diseases, Hep A, and whooping cough or pertussis. Um, class A3, by the end of the week, Hep B and Lyme disease actually fall into that category. Class B, you're reporting only by the number of cases by the end of the work week. For that one, an example would be chicken pox. And then um, class C would be report of an outbreak itself. So you could think of something such as like a staph skin outbreak, maybe in a hospital, that type of thing. That would be considered probably a class C. Okay? All right. This isn't the best uh, lecture together because it's just a lot of terms that you guys just have to memorize, okay? Or understand, I shouldn't say memorize, I should say understand. Um, so microbial control, know the difference between sepsis and asepsis. Anybody have a question about that? I mean, it's pretty straightforward, right? Can I just keep zooming through here? Is that okay? Okay. These guys are pretty um, self-explanatory as well. They are on the test, so I don't know if you guys want to mark the slides as they go, but I will ask you a couple questions definitely on this slide. And basically, just remember to know the differences here. Um, then de-germing, the big thing on that one is to remember that it's on a limited area, okay, versus sanitation. And then, of course, make sure you remember biocide versus bacteriostasis. So one, you're killing the microbes, the other one, you're just inhibiting the microbes. And then there's an example of an exponential death rate, okay? Just some extra stuff in here. All right, factors that are going to influence the degree of killing. There is your big list of factors. Um, these are all going to be dependent, <clears throat> the organism, on the biochemical composition and various protective mechanisms. But well, all of these things are very important. So if you start, and we're looking at type of organisms, let's talk about biofilms really quick. So we mentioned this, I think it was the first day of class, that basically you're talking about a community or aggregation of microbes. And then they're going to attach to a solid surface, and basically they become their own little community. Okay? We have them on our teeth, all right? They're on rocks, pipes. Um, the big one where it becomes a problem is when they're on medical devices. And that happens a lot with like staph epidermis. They just won't get it clean enough, and the person goes under a procedure, and boom, they end up with this biofilm infection which if that happens, they're on antibiotics for like months at a time, not weeks, it's months. There's a picture of a uh, staph biofilm on a catheter, I think, or going towards a cath. Um, this slide, you guys, this is talking about chemical biocides and the most resistant to the least resistant. 
you basically have to know this slide, okay? Um, prions are at the very top being most resistant. You guys remember what prions are? Yeah, can you give an example of a prion? Mad cow disease? Mad cow disease is one, yeah. Mad cow disease for sure. So they would be classified as the most resistant. And then interestingly enough, if you go down, you have viruses with lipid envelopes would be one of the least resistant to chemical biocides. Do you guys find that interesting or not really? No, because they're the ones that the hand sanitizer kills. Supposedly. I don't really trust the hand sanitizer, but we can test it. Yeah. yeah, we can test that, I'm sure. Um, but make sure you guys kind of can put these together on the slide, okay? All right. Um, number of organisms, that's referred to as the microbial load. That's going to tell you how many organisms are present. Um, obviously, higher numbers are going to probably require longer exposure times. You like my spelling on that one? That was really good. Um, concentration of disinfectant agent. It's going to vary with different agents. You know, think about bleach versus Lysol versus, I don't know, Mr. Clean. You know, I'd always go for bleach if I were you. Um, and dependent on, too, the proper concentrations. If you have it diluted, it's not going to do its job versus if it's straight out of the bottle, right? Um, organic material can also get in the way. So if you're talking about blood, mucus, or pus, that can inactivate disinfecting agents, okay? So they always have to watch out for that. And that, again, goes back to a problem with instruments and services in the hospitals that they need to be cleaned with the excess organic material before the disinfection. <clears throat> Contact time. That's going to be critically important. Too little is going to be too late, basically. You're not going to be able to kill what you need to kill. Um, it's going to vary from agent to agent as well. Um, and then the difference between disinfecting and sterilizing. What is the difference between disinfecting and sterilizing? Disinfecting is being clean, but sterilizing is being like no microbes, nothing killing completely dead. Okay, so you could say that disinfectant would be like a defined scope that you're targeting versus sterilizing, you're removing all microbial life. Okay? Make sure you know the difference between those two. Temperature, again, you're usually using the disinfectant at room temperature. Um, activity is going to be based on the regulation of the degrees. Um, methods for disinfection and sterilization. Make a mark by this slide as well because I ask you differences between critical and semi-critical materials versus non-critical materials, okay? Um, invading sterile tissue would be critical, semi-critical, um, talking about mucous membranes, and then non-critical, intermediate to low level disinfectant would be classified as non-critical materials. Um, difference between thermal death point and thermal death Time, okay, know that difference as well for heat. Then you have moist heat sterilization. For us, we always use the autoclave. So obviously steam under pressure, basically that's a picture of what it looks like. Our huge autoclave, I don't even know if you guys know that we have one, um, it's never working. Did you guys ever know that we had a big autoclave in this building? That's over there. Yeah, and it would make the most horrible sounds, um, and it never works. So you get these little ones. Pasteurization is another one. You're going to reduce spoilage of organisms and pathogens. Um, high temperature, short time, and ultra high temperature. So two different ones on that one. And then you have dry heat sterilization. Um, by oxidation, you have these examples underneath, OK? I don't really get into this that much on the exam, so I wouldn't even suggest that you need to highlight these um, slides that I just went over the past like three, OK? Um, filtration, HEPA, rates. <clears throat> okay, physical methods of microbial control. This is definitely on the exam. So low temperature or high pressure. Um, desiccation prevents metabolism. I would know which each one does, okay? 
alcohols. I don't get into the alcohols, so you're safe on that. And then the last couple of slides here, these are just for you guys, if when you have time to go over and read them, they're just of interest for you, especially when you get into your internships, just the regulations on the chemical skin and over-the-counter drugs, okay? Um, and healthcare settings. So just when you have a chance, just take a look at it. It's pretty interesting. Okay, and then there's just a couple points to remember through all of those slides itself. So far, out of all of the lectures that you have so far, I would say that this one, collection and processing, is probably the most important and has the most information on it, okay? This one is going to definitely be the one that's hit hard on the exam. Almost every slide in here is important, okay? And this is what you're going to be facing when you're out on your internships. So, Lance, some of this should be familiar to you. Okay. All right. Let's start. You have basic principles of specimen collection. Like what's actually going on? So most important thing, and remember this one, is that you want to collect specimen in the acute phase of the infection, not when they've already had antibiotics. Okay? So collecting during acute phase. They want to collect, obviously, on the right anatomic site for the collection. And this stuff sounds pretty stupid, doesn't it? That, like, this is common sense. But you would be surprised how many times this stuff doesn't occur in the hospital. It's scary. Um, the appropriate quantity, if they want to run multiple tests, you need to have enough of it there. And then packaged in a, con in a container to maintain viability. Um, label with the patient name and the site, and then transport and store correctly. So those are just basics of specimen collection right there, okay? Then you have collection procedures. So when you're talking about that, you're really talking about cultures that should be in sterile containers. The one that is different is stool specimens. Those you're just talking about clean, leak-proof containers. That sounds lovely, doesn't it? <laughs> um, you, swabs are okay for upper respiratory tract, external ear, eye, and genital tract. You're okay to use swabs. You have transport media that's used. That we, we went over, and I'll get into that a little bit more. That would be the Amy Stewart's or charcoal. You have something else called a gym bag system. Um, and then you also have wounds and lesions that are going to pose problems. Anybody know why wounds and lesions would pose a problem for collection? Would it have to do like what you said earlier about the pus? And, uh, you guys are both like on the same track here. What you're saying? Different bacteria are going to be mixed. Exactly. Yeah. Contamination from normal flora, especially if you're just swabbing the area or whatever, you almost would have to do um, an aspirate or whatever with a needle to go in when it's a deep, like if it's like a staph infection or under the skin. Otherwise, you're going to get tons of normal flora out of it. Um, specimen collection guidelines. These guys need to know the specimen and then what's the container type. Okay? So the one that sticks out to me would be um, blood culture, obviously, and then body fluids. It needs to be anaerobic transport. Um, outer ear, you're still talking about swab transport system. Okay, the rest of them are screw cap tubes that are sterile. But make sure you guys review those as well, okay? And then remember that the stool just has to be in a leak-proof container that's <laughs> clean. <laughs> yeah. Cool with the blood culture models. Are you going to have to know like one thing real quick and one thing real quick and which order you No, no, no. Okay. Collection guidelines, this uh, keeps on going with the different specimens and the container. Unfortunately, you guys, you have to know this, like these lists of things, okay? So those two slides, I would definitely highlight or whatever you're doing to make sure you study these, okay? And then finishing up, then you have your urine and catheter. So clean catch and midstream. So clean catch, everybody knows what that means, right? No. No? I don't know what that means. Seriously? Who can explain who that means? Catch? Better white. Not the... No, I'm just assuming that everybody knew this. Um, not the first void of the day, right? And then also... Well, sometimes usually you want it in the morning. 
because of it's most concentrated in the morning. But definitely midstream. Midstream. Yeah. yeah. But when you say clean catch, though, what does that mean? Yeah. Well, wipe. Yeah. Wipe it down before you actually piss into the container. <laughs> front to back. I did not know that. From front. <laughs> From front to back. Exactly. If you see, women would know this because if you go into like the GYN or whatever, and they have to touch your urine, they always do that. If you're to wipe. Do it, clean catch, blah, 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 and you hand it to the nurse. Okay. Um, yeah, this is kind of gross, but um, catheter is also still sterile screw cap as well. Okay? Now, once you have that stuff, you're going to have to have proper identification. So what I want you guys to pay attention to is that the proper identification is going to be different from the requisition form, which is the next slide. Okay? This is all the information that you need for so-called proper identification. So date and time collection is very important, and the culture site, position, room number, ID number, and name. Okay? Do you want to say something here again? No. Mm -hmm. With the requisition form, that's what the doctor is writing. Right. Right. So requisition form, you get into a little bit more detail here. Now you're getting into like age and gender. Um, physician's name and address, specific anatomic site, what is the so-called clinical diagnosis, are they on anti any antimicrobial agents, and who's actually transcribing the orders, okay? Um, so just make sure that you have those two pretty straight. So specimen storage guidelines. So you have refrigerate on one side, which is interesting on some of them. And then you have the room temperature on the other side. So notice the urine, unpreserved versus preserved. Okay, same thing for the feces. You're at two different temperatures. Okay, the other one that I would pay attention to as well would be the CSF for viruses versus CSF for bacteria. Okay, refrigeration versus room temperature. Um, anticoagulants. Those are going to be used to prevent body of the specimen. So SPS is your most common one. Heparin is also used. They use that to, for viruses and isolation of mycobacterium from the blood. Oops. Okay. Here's where we get into the holding and transport media. Okay. Um, basically, you have you're going to work with Amy's. I think we got a sample of Amy's transport media, so you guys will see that in the lab. So you have Stuart Aves. The charcoal actually absorbs fatty acids given off by the swab. So that's what the purpose of the charcoal is for. And then the gym bag <laughs> is actually a commercial transport. So it's selective auger and the CO2 generating tap. And then you also have bedside collection as well. If you're doing that, then it gets processed right away. Um, if you're in a lab that's basically not local, you also have standards for shipping infectious substances. And you guys can just read through this one. I don't ask you really anything about this, okay? It's not super duper important. You can kind of cross that one off. Um, specimen receipt and processing. This is definitely on the test. You have a four level scheme of prioritization. Um, level one, you're talking critical. That would be stuff such as amniotic fluid, blood, um, CSF, heart valves, <clears throat> excuse me. Level two is unprotected and may degrade quickly, okay? Um, level two, body fluids, bone, um, drainage from wounds, feces. Level three requires quantification. That would be urine or a catheter tip. And then level four is preserved. So when you were seeing before, like feces that's in preservatives or urine in preservatives, or swabs that are in a holding medium would be considered a level four. And I think I have these examples for you too, okay? Let's see, you guys have that. So level one, critical, level two, unpreserved, level three, quantification, and level four, preserved. All right, you guys straight on that? Then you didn't have to like, write it down really quick. <laughs> Okay, what are unacceptable specimens and rejection? So if the info on the requisition doesn't match info on the specimen label, it's getting rejected. Or I should say it should get rejected. I don't know if they actually follow this 100%. They go through away. Do they really? Yeah. Or are you going to have to go back to like um, 
registration and get them to confirm the it's correct okay. requisition form and all that. Right. Um, specimens not submitted in appropriate transport container or the container is leaking, aka your fecal sample. Okay. Um, there's not enough quantity so that you can perform the test that you want to perform. It's going to get rejected again. And then this is important. If the specimen transport time is more than two hours and the specimen is not preserved, it's going to get rejected. So you have to have it preserved if it's going to be over that amount of time. Okay? All of those are very important. And it continues. Um, anaerobic cultures, because this is where you're getting normal flora, can be a question. Um, processing results in questionable data. The specimen is dried up. That should be an obvious one. If there's more than one specimen from the same source who submitted from the same patient on the same day. That doesn't make much sense when I said that. I tried to say that three times fast. <laughs> you'll get some time. Um, blood cultures is the exception for that one. Um, let's see. And then one swab is submitted for multiple requests of various organisms. That's going to get rejected. You need to have one swab per test per organism. Okay. All right. Um, so what happens after they actually uh, reject it? Usually there's going to be a phone call. There has to be documentation. And basically, it's considered an unacceptable specimen. Um, but even if it's, like I said, the wrong container or the quantity is not enough, it's considered suboptimal. Okay. Um, if it makes it through, then we're going into direct microscopic observation. Okay, and these are the reasons why the direct microscopic observation are good or can be good. Okay? Let me see. Um, if we get past that, you move right along into primary inoculation. So remember, you're going to have to know your types of media. Um, I think we beat this one to death by the first PowerPoint. I think you guys are good with this, right? Mm -hmm. the media. Okay? Okay? Requirements for growth. Chemically, here's your list again. You guys have seen this in the previous PowerPoint. Oxygen, as an example, here are the tubes again. Um, and then the rest of this, basically, you guys can get from the first PowerPoint. It's just talking about the auger. Again, I think maybe you got this from me. You know what I'm thinking about. <laughs> the culture media. Anaerobic culture media, producing media. Remember that biofluid that you actually do the oxygen levels in is considered a reducing media because you're driving the O2 off. Okay? Selective media, okay, unwanted microbes and encourage the desire. That's an MSA play right there. Differentials, there's a nice BAT plate for you. Okay, street plate method. I don't know what you guys have been taught in 2010. I'm hoping it's not a nightmare. Um, I've heard it's people do four street quadrants. We do three. What have you guys done? Four. Really? Four? Four. Three. You've done three. Okay. Four. In this class, I prefer you to do three, and we'll go over how to do that. It's, not, it's actually easier than doing four. Um, but I think the growth is just better for the three, okay? But if you have any questions about that, maybe we can practice doing that. It's not a big deal. Um, media selection. This is what you want to base it on, okay? Um, one of the big things is that you're going to need a normal form to distinguish from what you're actually looking at as pathogenic. And then, of course, your fastidious pathogens, you're going to need um, specialized media, such as like chocolate. Okay, routine primary plating media. This is basically the steps that you would be doing, okay? You get a non-selective auger plate, such as like a TSA, or even a BAP, you can consider that. And then you move on into enriched media, and then get into selective and differential media, okay? And it would go in these sort of steps. And then, on the board, I wanted you guys to pay attention to, after that, what happens with interpreting the results, and then what happens if you have a non-routine specimen, okay? So before you leave, make sure you take a snapshot of the board, okay? Because these two um, 
questions will come up on the exam. It will basically be a short answer, I'm sure. Okay? Are you complaining already? <laughs> this has to do with the culture workup. That's interpreting the results, which is on the board. And then the non-routine specimen, I took the basics and put it on the board for you. Okay, so you don't have to know that entire slide. Alrighty? And then there's some of your critical values, like 